Good evening. I'm Joe Flynn. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer for Norton Medical Group and the Physician Chief in the Norton Cancer Institute. On behalf of Norton Healthcare, Norton Cancer Institute, and the Norton Healthcare Foundation, welcome to 26th Gail Klein Garlove Lectureship. We're glad that you've joined us for tonight's program, Hitting the Target, Precision Medicine and Colorectal Cancer. Of course, this lectureship would not be possible without the generous gift of the Garlove family and their friends who established this ongoing educational program in honor of Gail Klein Garlov. Gail Klein Garlov, as you know, is a dedicated mother, community-minded volunteer, selfless individual who was always willing to give whatever she had for the benefit of others. She's a strong woman who fought a courageous battle against colon cancer, but sadly lost that battle in 1994. We'll start off with this video tonight that gives you a glimpse into the history of the Garlov lectureship and the generosity of the Garlov family. Gail Klein Garlov was a Louisville woman known for her friendly smile, generous nature, and volunteer spirit. Tragically, her life was cut short by colon cancer, just ahead of her 55th birthday. But Gail's loved ones vowed to not let Gail and the goodness she represented be forgotten, which led to a lecture series in her honor. Who could have foreseen that out of the tragedy of this uh, young woman's death and her family's trauma, that something this exciting and positive could happen? Medical oncologist Dr. Tom Woodcock cared for Gail through her colon cancer journey at Norton Cancer Institute. And when her family wanted to honor her memory in a special way, Dr. Woodcock stepped up in 1995 as the founding physician of the Garlov Lectureship. It's important to understand that the uh, lectureship was different. This wasn't just having some traveling expert come to Louisville with a box of slides. They were interested in trying to raise knowledge, not just in the professional community, but in the community at large. It's because of the Garlove family's generous contributions through the Norton Healthcare Foundation that the Norton Cancer Institute has been able to provide for decades this free annual educational event for medical professionals and the public. As the Garlove family continues to grow, so does the lectureship it started so many years ago. I remember when it first started, uh, we were at the uh, Norton Hospital downtown and it was in a auditorium and there were probably 20 people there the first evening and most of those people were there because Dr. Woodcock went out into the hallway and said, we're having a lectureship tonight, will you please come? Each year, the event attracts hundreds of people from across the community, from doctors to patients and community members as they listen to and learn from nationally recognized physicians about the latest and most innovative cancer treatments. Early on, we had so many people that were struggling with cancer, they were in treatment, they wanted to find out what options they had. And so being able to give them that information at a level that they could understand as far as does this relate to your specific type of cancer and are you a candidate for this, rather than which chemical tracer they're, they're looking to track. You know, it's good to have that information, but it's also to know, good to know how does this directly impact me as I'm struggling to deal with cancer? Fighting cancer takes a village. This event aims to empower the whole community through education because everyone deserves to be armed with knowledge, especially when it comes to one's health. I think the lectureship is such a great example of that, of bringing the clinical world together with the community and saying, look, we're in this together. It's no different than our care model. And um, it's really beautiful to see. Before we go any further, I want to thank the Garlove family. Lee Garlove and his wife, Dr. Amy Garlove, Matt Garlove and his wife, Dana, and the whole extended family who I've gotten to know over the last six years. Um, really incredible um, people and um, I'm honored to, to know them. Because of their generosity, clinicians learn about the most advanced treatments in cancer from some of the country's leading cancer researchers and practitioners. Thank you for making a difference in the lives of thousands of families facing a diagnosis of cancer and honoring the legacy of Gail Klein Garlove. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker. Tony Saab is a professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science. He's a leader of gastrointestinal cancer program 
and the Director of the Clinical Cancer Research Office for the Enterprise-Wide Mayo Clinic Cancer Center. He's a Vice Chair and Section Chief for Medical Oncology for the Division of Hematology and Oncology in the Department of Internal Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, Arizona. He's also the Consortium Chair for the ACCRU Research Network and Clinical Research Co-Lead for the MCC Transformation Leadership Team, the Mayo Enterprise. Additionally, He's a Mayo Clinic member for the NCCN Guidelines Steering Committee, which is the committee that really drives change in, in care for um, gastroenterologic uh, cancers. He's currently the co-leader of the Hepatobiliary Cancer Subcommittee of the Alliance for Clinical Trials and Oncology, and the vice chair for the National Cancer Institute's Hepatobiliary Task Force. Also a member of the ASCO Scientific Program Committee for Colorectal and Anal Cancers. He was previously at the Ohio State University Arthur G. James Cancer Hospital and Solove Research Institute as a tenured professor of medicine and pharmacy and section chief for the gastrointestinal cancer program. Dr. Sovereign is medical degree from the American University of Beirut in Lebanon and completed a residency in internal medicine at Indiana University Medical Center in Indianapolis. He then completed fellowships in clinical pharmacology and experimental therapeutics in hematology and oncology at Tufts University New England Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. He now conducts clinical and translational research focused on developing anti-cancer agents for patients with gastrointestinal cancers. His extensive collaboration with various science, scientists and industry partners resulted in the design and execution of innovative clinical trials, including many first in human studies. His research includes a large focus on the incorporation of agents that target multiple facets of cancer, including genetic and epigenetic drivers, as well as the feeding microenvironment and the immune milieu. Dr. Saab's research has led to the launch of a number of phase two and phase three clinical trials, including, but not limited to a recent trial with cancer stem cell inhibitor and a pivotal study leading to regulatory approval for treating pancreatic cancer and the development of an inhibitor in bile duct cancers. He serves as a reviewer for many high impact journals and sits on editorial board of prestigious journals such as the, the Journal of National Cancer Institute. He's authored or co-authored more than 350 peer-reviewed publications, abstracts, and book chapters in many distinguished journals. Um, I've known Tony for many years, and I'll tell you, he is an amazing clinician that is sought out by patients all over the world. He's a great, um, a great uh, researcher, a great scientist, and has really changed the complexion of gastrointestinal uh, research and the treatment of cancer patients. So please join me in welcoming to the Garland Lectureship, Dr. Tony Saab. Joe, you know, thank you. I appreciate the kind uh, introduction. Again, as I, as I mentioned, I, I wish uh, we were able to be uh, together, but understanding that uh, these are uh, interesting times uh, that we all live in. And hopefully we'll meet again live uh, very soon. I'm very optimistic about that. So the, the title of, uh, and, and the focus of this, uh, this lecture will be on the emerging role of precision medicine in, in, in metastatic colorectal cancer and how to actually optimize hitting, hitting the target. These are my disclosures. And I think it's very important as a clinician to think about what, what brings us, what influences us when we think about treatment choices and options for our patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. Multiple characteristics are important, and, and there may be more in, to take in consideration as we think about therapy that's tailored according to individual patient needs. It's important to pay attention to age, of course, other uh, illnesses, uh, performance status. There are certain tumor characteristics that are very important. Uh, one is how symptomatic uh, is the cancer uh, 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 and how symptomatic is the patient. Uh, the presence of isolated uh, metastases, so spots that uh, may involve only the liver or the lungs, that can be addressable actually by surgery or radiation, uh, not necessarily by chemotherapy. Uh, and that's important to get into the equation with this. Uh, tumor location matters, right versus left-sided tumors. Uh, and we'll talk just very briefly about those because they tend to actually behave differently. The right tends to be more aggressive. 
Uh, the left tends to be uh, less so, but they also carry different mutations. Uh, molecular characteristics, and that's what we spent quite a bit of time talking about where we're moving next, where we're starting to break uh, colorectal cancer into multiple diseases, not just one, uh, depending on the, the genetic driver. And these are genetics that are particular to the cancer, not to the patient, although some of them are influenced by the genetics of the patient. Uh, so uh, mutations in RAS, mutations in BRAF, so two proteins and uh, the genes and proteins and uh, looking at microsatellite uh, instability and that can link actually to Lynch syndrome, but also uh, tell us about uh, uh, the likelihood of responding to immune therapy. HER2, uh, which is uh, amplification, which is a target that's commonly present in gastric and, uh, and breast cancer. Uh, but we're finding out that in colon cancer, it has uh, significance as well. And of course, very important patient autonomy and patient preference. The importance of focusing on quality of life, the toxicity profile, and ultimately uh, uh, the patient desire to go through this journey. So just a brief point on location, uh, tumor location. So we have essentially with the colon, we have the ascending on the right side and the descending on the left side. And the one I blocked in the middle is the transverse colon, uh, uh, which is uh, you know the 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 less uh, 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 less common uh, cancer and a little bit uh, difficult to to pinpoint uh, if it's more to the right or to the left. Mostly because it remains a little bit more aggressive than the left side. We tend to consider transverse the colon. Uh, in, 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 in our treatment options, more right-sided rather than the left-sided component. But important to note that the right-sided, as they're more aggressive, they also tend to respond even when they have all the right uh, uh, gene ge genomic components, they tend not to respond to anti-EGFR inhibitors. Both sides seem to respond relatively well to chemotherapy plus uh, an anti-angiogenic agent, the vasizumab. Uh, on the right side, the right side, the tumors tend to have more of these MSI high uh, related tumors, which do respond to immune therapy, but they also have more mutations in the BRF and the RAS pathways, which confer a, a more aggressive uh, uh, phenotype. And then uh, HER2 positive uh, amplified tumors more on the left side. Again, before we go through the discussion of precision medicine, I, I, I cannot but overemphasize the importance for most patients of consideration of the appropriate chemotherapy. Uh, this study came from Italy. It's a great study. It's essentially, I think, in many ways, changed the standard of care. And specifically, as we're seeing more and more of the younger patient populations showing up with more advanced cancer, uh, it's been... Uh, almost an epidemic in the younger patients. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of patients in their 40s, 50s, even in their 30s, and I've treated patients in their teens, um, you know, with colon cancer, just tragic. Uh, we can't completely explain why, but it's important that we continue to create more options uh, and more ways to detect this early. But this study essentially emphasized the importance of a three drug regimen versus a two drug regimen, even in sequence. And the key here is to expose patients to the intense uh, chemotherapeutic regimen for a limited uh, uh, cycle number. Uh, and this study was eight in my practice, it's six. I don't think you need to go beyond six. And then you drop to maintenance and reinitiate if needed. And this essentially has, uh, in, in many ways, changed uh, uh, the standard for most of our patients, especially the younger cohort, and younger is actually anywhere younger than 70, even for some patients in the 70 to 75. But even more important when we start thinking about our youngest patients that are showing up with colon cancer. And we published this in uh, JAMA Oncology uh, a couple of years ago, and this essentially looked at all the data that uh, has been published over the many years uh, that uh, uh, looked at a strategy of giving patients a complete break from treatment after exposure to three to four months uh, versus continuing some form of treatment. And it was interesting to see that, and that is confirmed uh, in individual studies as well, and more recently the TRIPE-2 that I've shown you, 
that uh, patients who actually end up uh, going from intense therapy to uh, a maintenance therapy uh, do have an improvement in their progression-free survival. Uh, so essentially uh, uh, limits, limits progression of their cancer. Uh, versus <clears throat> observation, but survival is not affected much, which essentially means if your patient says, you know, doc, I'm, I'm done. Uh, I want a break. I want to go on a, on a, on a trip, uh, visit family. I think it's okay to consider a break after you achieve a relative response, since the ultimate outcome is how well we improve the survival of our patients. I still prefer to keep patients on a maintenance level, but, but occasionally, uh, uh, you know, after the discussion grant, a complete holiday. So now moving on to, you know, where uh, cancer is, treatment is moving. I mean, that's one area. There are other areas. Uh, but in colon cancer specifically, uh, the, 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 the field is moving towards precision medicine. This was actually, if, if anyone recalls this, this was from 2001, and it was essentially uh, imatinib. Uh, which, uh, which was uh, first uh, developed in CML uh, uh, and ultimately made it to GIST. Some remarkable responses. And the thought was at the time that this is how it's going to be for all cancers. All we have to do is find uh, that, uh, that target and find the silver, uh, silver bullet that's going to hit the target. Unfortunately, the reality turns out to be a little bit tougher to digest, and, and we spend a lot of time trying to understand uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, markers that, that we call predictive biomarkers that help us find that silver bullet. And, and unfortunately, there are very few far in between. Um, the good news is that we continue to find more and more of them. They're not common. They're very different, and we have to design the right drugs for them as well. So in, 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 in oncology overall, we have two types of biomarkers, the predictive and the prognostic, uh, which means prognostic, they tell you, you know, how bad the cancer is. Predictive, they actually predict for a target. And most uh, targets that we work with are, uh, you know, what I call prognostic. Uh, they have both uh, a predictive element and a prognostic element. And it's important to differentiate between the two or when the two are combined, that's fine, but differentiate between the two because a prognostic biomarker does not tell you uh, uh, how well your treatment works. It just tells you how bad your cancer is. The good news is that we're learning how to find these uh, uh, predictive uh, biomarkers more and more through uh, personalized medicine. And traditionally, you know, what we've done, we've gone through, you know, say a chemotherapy drug and one cancer uh, and then from a phase one to a phase two to a phase three to approval. So we see a little benefit, uh, uh, but, 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 but that benefit is uh, essentially means we have to expose a lot of patients to the drug for very few to benefit. Now we're moving more and more into this genomically driven drug approval process, which means, you know, we identify the target, we go after it, and we, we do the development in very specific subgroups. Now, that doesn't mean 100% of the patients are going to respond, but we're getting closer to 40, 50%. We still, you know, have a long way to understand what drives, for example, resistance. And we'll talk a little bit about this. And we have tools now to help us deal with that a little bit better. Uh, and I think, you know, we're getting better and better at understanding, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, in, 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 in the mechanisms of resistance that would create multiple targeted options for our patients. Now, chemotherapy is not going away for most patients yet, but we're hoping that we'll get to that day at some point. Uh, and I'm op optimistic that this will not be too far off from today. Now, in colorectal cancer, uh, you know, we're finding that colon cancer is multiple diseases, not just one, based on how we break them down um, for, uh, genomically. Uh, and, and this represents uh, just a, a view of this. Uh, there are more. Some of them are what we call uh, negative predictive biomarkers, meaning biomarkers that essentially tell us that the drug does not work. Now, these are good, but we, we, we want to move into the positive predictive biomarkers, meaning that you find that biomarker that tells you what drug actually works uh, and, 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 and select those patients. Uh, and so you can see that this pie has broken uh, colon cancer and that pie continues to get refined. 
between those that have mutations in RAS, which typically is a, predict, a, predict, a negative predictive biomarker for anti-EGFR. However, now we're finding that there, uh, there are subclassifications of RAS that essentially tell us who may respond to an inhibitor that is specifically targeted to RAS, specifically G12C. Talk a little bit more about this later. KRAS was thought to be non-druggable, so it was it was thought that uh, that this this was essentially a lock that we're not going to find the key for. Well, the good news is that we found the first key for G G12C, which is about two percent of all uh, of all RASes. Uh, another one that's moving also along is G12D, which is another two to five percent of RASes, and more coming. So now this lock we're finding multiple keys for each one of those locks. I'm very optimistic that uh, with this, and we have quite a few bit experience with that, we're gonna finally unlock essentially KRAS and make it a druggable and targetable uh, 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 gene. Uh, BRF V600E, a lot of development there, moving now to the first line. Uh, the non V600E, which is about 5% of all patients with colon cancer, uh, those we're learning, we have some studies ongoing in this in this area as well to try to understand if they're particularly uh, uh, targetable. That we know it's prognostic, meaning it, it confers a good outcome, uh, but we haven't tested drugs yet there, and that's what we're doing uh, as one of our next steps. Then HER2 amplifications, we have quite a few uh, drugs moving along there, and we'll talk about some of those. Uh, we're very excited about one particular study that we hope to present next year. Um, it's, it's the largest in this, in this field. And then, uh, uh, you know, promote negative outcomes with EGFR inhibitors. Then M uh, MSI high, uh, which confers a, a, a really meaningful outcome for patients with MSI high and colon cancer in the first line. We'll talk about some of that data and then n -track fusions. And then there are others as well. Uh, and again, we'll talk about all these. So as I said, you know, we, we had a bunch of negative predictive biomarkers, but really what's exciting is moving to the positive predictive biomarkers. And one of those is, is um, as, as, uh, as a point of discussion is this whole world of immune therapy that we've been living in, in the last, for the last few years that have really transformed the way we treat uh, uh, cancers and colon cancer, uh, but also a lot of other cancers. And in this sense, uh, you know, blocking uh, PD-1 or blocking also PD-L1 will essentially remove that suppressed T cell uh, from its, uh, what I call bear hug uh, from the tumor cell. And essentially, as soon as you release that, that, that link, uh, the cell gets activated uh, and it attacks the tumor cell. Now, the key is you have to have those cells present in the vicinity of the tumor. So just giving a PD-1 inhibitor uh, uh, to patients is not going to have an effect unless your tumor is enriched with these T cells. One particular type of tumor in colon cancer, which is enriched with those, is essentially uh, those with MSI high or mismatch repair deficiency. As I said, you can see those uh, uh, in pre with prevalence uh, with Lynch syndrome, but also we see them in about a couple of percent of patients. So half of the patients with colon cancer will uh, also have those sporadically, meaning uh, without a link to, to the genetics of the patient. And um, when looking at colorectal carcinoma, uh, we see those in about 4% of the patients and 6% of all across stages. Those are what we call hypermutated tumors, and they're loaded with mutations, and they essentially are very, very inflammatory, which means you have a lot of these cells present uh, in the tumor environment, which essentially makes them uh, uh, very sensitive to the effects of immune therapy. In this particular study, after, you know, we, we've been part of the initial studies when I was at Ohio State that uh, led uh, to pembrolizumab, uh, PD-1, an antibody targeting PD-1 to be approved uh, by the FDA in later lines of therapy. And we thought it makes a lot of sense to bring this to first line. And I've, I've, I've moved that to, in my clinic to the first line pending the results of the study, which essentially looked at MSI high patient, patients with colon cancer uh, who were randomized to pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy of choice. And uh, this study was positive for uh, for all its, uh, its endpoints, about half of the patients had a very solid response. 
when we look at the progression free survival, one of the core primary uh, endpoints along with survival, you can see doubling uh, of the progression free survival at the median. But I think the most exciting piece is that if you look uh, at patients followed up through three, four, and now five years, uh, that 40% of, of, uh, of our patients that uh, receive PD-1 inhibitors are in a cure. These are metastatic. These are stage four uh, colon cancers that ultimately uh, 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 undergo the equivalent of a cure and may never see chemotherapy in their lifetime. And in this study, just to put this in context, in patients who received chemotherapy, uh, uh, about 60% uh, about of those patients were crossed over to PD-1 inhibitors, which may explain why the survival did not reach at least the statistical uh, uh, level of significance. But uh, speaking clinically, uh, there, there is de a definite improvement with pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy, despite the fact that 60% of patients on the chemo crossed over to pembro. Giving uh, the PD-1 inhibitors earlier essentially meant that the patients have a higher likelihood of surviving. This is five years later. This has not reached the mean, and it's likely uh, the survival is likely going to be six to seven years on average. But as we've seen with the progression-free survival, 40% of those patients will remain alive uh, and uh, progression-free beyond five years. So this is a great uh, uh, improvement and then moved PD-1 to the first line. We're trying to understand whether uh, increasing uh, uh, the level of inhibition at the checkpoint level uh, with adding a CTLA-4 inhibitor will, will enhance further the activity of the PD-1 inhibitor. We don't know that yet. We have studies from uh, uh, phase two studies uh, that are moving now to phase three randomized and awaiting the phase three randomized. The caveat with that is of course, more toxicities come with it. And so uh, we'll see what the end results uh, will, uh, will result in once we have the next study, just checkmate uh, ATW. I just brief word about, you know, when we talked about these MSI high patients and we said, you know, part of the reason why they, they seem to be so responsive to these PD-1 inhibitors is because they're, they're loaded with mutations. And so there was this study, this is not particularly for colon cancer, it did include some colon cancer patients, which essentially uh, uh, looked at the association of uh, tumor mutational burden, so high tumor mutational burden uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with PD-1 and specifically pembrolizumab. And, and you can see that uh, some patient, many patients had actually a very meaningful response, very similar to what you see with MSI high. Now they define tumor mutational burden high as anything above 10. That's how it's reported, that's how it's approved. The reality is those between 10 and 15 and arguably between 10 and 20 do not have the same level of meaningful response than those with above 20. So that's a caveat to keep in mind as you think about your patients uh, with colon cancer and high tumor, tumor mutational burden. The other thing uh, that is uh, confusing about the TMB is it's, there are uh, what we call liquid biopsy platforms. So platforms that use circulating tumor DNA and we'll touch upon that, that report a tumor mutational burden. However, uh, without a, a level of validation uh, and, and, and are not usable at this point of time. So 10 to 15, uh, you know, reasonable, uh, above 15, above 20 specifically, you will start seeing very meaningful uh, outcomes uh, with pembrolizumab. So I want to move, move on to one of the targets uh, that we continue to develop uh, uh, strategies with, and that's BRF b 600 e And BRF v 600 e has been known, at least in the world of melanoma, as a mutation, as one of the major drivers. And essentially the response rate was single agent vimurafenib was 50%. They've come a long way since then. And, uh, and you see responses higher than that with dual, but 50% for one agent is pretty darn good. When, when moving to colon cancer, it wasn't, it wasn't as uh, significant. The response rate was less than 5% for the same target. It was less than 5%. And uh, these responses were not durable. I mean, I think that's important to understand. So not 
uh, and not all targets are, create, are equal across malignancies. And that, that talks to the particularities and the importance of studying these questions in individual cancers, in this case, in colon cancer. So the, the, the question is why uh, did uh, RAF, uh, uh, RAF inhibition in, in BRAF V600E mutated colorectal cancer did not induce the same level of response than in melanoma? The answer ended up being that adaptive resistance, so that feedback loop mechanism, that once you block RAF, you get activation of EGFR. And by the way, EGFR inhibitors don't, uh, uh, don't work in BRAF V600D mutant pay, uh, colorectal cancers. However, when you block BRAF V600D, EGFR actually becomes relevant again, and you have to actually block both. So that turns out to be true for BRAF, but also true for anything down that, what we call the MAPK pathway, from RAS to RAF to MEK1. So any, any one of those you're gonna block, you will need to also block EGFR because they all have the same feedback loop mechanism. And indeed that actually enhanced the response rate significantly. And that led to this uh, study called BEACON, which was a randomized study looking at the RAF inhibitor and carafinib plus an EGFR inhibitor, cetuximab, plus uh, minus binimitinib, which is a MEK inhibitor. And just as a reminder, the MEK is just underneath RAF. And so the thought is dub doubling up on the, on the inhibition. And that was uh, compared to uh, chemotherapy plus cetuximab. This study uh, came back positive for all its endpoints. And, uh, you know, interestingly, the triplet and the doublet looked very similar. Uh, the, uh, the triplet had a little bit more of a response rate. However, if you look at what we call the disease control rate, meaning what, what, how many patients did not progress, uh, they were pretty much the same with the, two, with the two. But the difference was with the toxicities. The doublet actually uh, had more favorable toxicity even when compared to the control. And that's interesting. And there's an interesting mechanism is when you combine the RAF inhibitor with the EGFR inhibitor, uh, it seems that there is a protective effect on the skin and cuts down the risk of diarrhea. So actually the patients have less toxicities than you would have if you had the individual agents given. So in combination, they're safer than uh, their individual administration. That was not true when you add the MEK inhibitor with a triplet, uh, which actually ended up doing the worst in terms of the toxicity. So ultimately the FDA approved the doublet, so encorafinib and cetuximab, which made a lot of sense. And this is now a standard for refractors so beyond first-line treatment uh, for patients with uh, um, colon cancer that harbors uh, BRAF mutations. It's important to understand now that also this is going to a study called Breakwater that's looking at the combination plus chemo uh, versus the combination itself versus standard chemo in uh, essentially uh, first line. So this is moving to first line. So now moving on to another target called, uh, so HER2. And HER2 amplifications are present in about three to 4% of the patients. They're most relevant in the RAS wild type tumors, not as much in the RAS mutated for you know, mechanisms that are biological in, in, in the sense that uh, uh, they create mechanisms of resistance. So most of the outcomes, positive outcomes have been in the wild type HER2 amplified tumors. So there was initial work done uh, uh, in, uh, in, in 2011 that essentially showed that uh, in, in colorectal cancer uh, tumors, these were models that were derived from uh, patients' cancers, that combining uh, lapatinib and trastuzumab which is an oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor targeting HER2 and trastuzumab, which targets essentially the receptor, uh, did much better than the agent, uh, the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and much better than uh, uh, trastuzumab or the monoclonal antibody. So the combination, uh, so unlike breast cancer, uh, at least in the first line, the combination of the two biologics seemed to fare much better than the one, and that led to two studies, Heracles and My Pathway, that included the colon cancer patients, and they chose a response rate in the 30% and, and a median progression free survival between three and four months. Uh, we presented the data on a study called Mountaineer, which started in our research consortium and, and has led eventually to an expanded study. 
uh, with an agent called tucatinib, which is an oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor, very specific to HER2, very safe to use, and already approved in breast cancer, uh, along with trastuzumab. Uh, we reported on the first uh, 26 patients. Now the study is about 120 and completed. Uh, and uh, uh, shown a response rate of 55% and a median progression-free survival, almost double what you've seen with the other agents, historically at least. The study is, uh, has, has been taken essentially into a larger study, uh, 120 patients, including randomization versus to catenip, completed in September. We expect to present the results, hopefully at ASPO 2022. We'll see if we have the data cleaned up and ready. Uh, but it will be presented next year uh, for sure. So this may actually, right now we don't have any FDA uh, approved regimens for her to amplified colon cancer. Uh, and we're hoping that this may form a good platform to build on. We're also starting to plan with a company on a phase three study in that space. Another HER2 uh, tar target therapy belongs to this family of HER2 directed antibody drug conjugates, very interesting agents. You know, we spent quite a few years working with those uh, and frankly, mostly uh, 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 to no avail. This one seems to be the, the more active ADC agent, uh, trastuzumab deroxtecan. It's active actually in all cancers that, that express HER2 that have been tested in, so whether it's breast, whether it's gastric, where it has approvals in the United States. And this is in colon cancer. So what this does is that there's a antibody that attaches to the target, uh, HER2. Now it doesn't care if the target is active or not. All it cares is its presence. So the target's presence. That's why it makes sense to place it beyond uh, a prior failure of trastuzumab-based therapies. There's an enzyme cleavable linker, and then the agent that actually causes the damage is this topoisomerase one inhibitor, a cytotoxic agent that gets released into the tumor. And the colon cancer cohort of Destiny CRC01 was uh, presented now twice. And um, what, what this study shows essentially is that uh, patients with, uh, with, uh, with HER2 amplified tumors have actually about 40 to 45% likelihood of a response. And you can see in the, on the, the orange arrows actually indicate those patients uh, who had prior anti-HER2 treatment. And those patients had very similar responses to the ones that were seen with those naive to anti-HER2. The one thing I tell you, and that's from experience and the study, is that this is not uh, an easy drug necessarily, and it does have its toxicities, uh, and you have to be very cautious about it. And that's why I favor this one uh, post other HER2 target therapies that tend to be safer. And one of the toxicities that is of most concern is interstitial lung disease. Uh, and actually, uh, in some patients can be quite crippling and others actually has led to death. Now, yes, the numbers look uh, uh, relatively smaller uh, uh, or, or relatively small, but I think it's pretty significant. Anything about 5% is, is of concern. Uh, and, and, and these, as I said, you know, can lead to lethal outcomes in some patients. The next target of, of interest, and, and this target is, is, is uh, uh, tumor agnostic, meaning it's not necessarily uh, particular to uh, colon cancer, but we find it in about 3%, uh, I'm sorry, 0.5% 0, 0 of patients with colon cancer. And there are two agents uh, uh, on the market available for this uh, fusion. And that's an agent called latotractinib and another agent called intractinib. And both uh, seem to derive some uh, some benefit uh, to those patients. Uh, you know, I've treated few patients uh, with colon cancer and pancreas cancer with, uh, with this NTRAC inhibitor. Uh, and some of the responses are remarkable. Others, you know, not so much, but, uh, but overall, uh, you know, when you find it, it's, it's, it's actually, it's, it's very satisfying. I want to circle back to that G12C, uh, and I'm very excited about this because this, this actually is opening up uh, uh, doors for us targeting uh, what we call the undruggable target. Now, this, is, this has moved from undruggable to druggable. And G12C essentially, because of its conformation, has made it, made it incredibly challenging to target for 40 years. Couldn't find a good way to target it until, until today. And we're seeing you know, significant developments. Uh, multiple agents are being developed and a couple of them actually are moving forward. MRTX849, uh, is the one we work the closest with. 
uh, and this targets G12C. The initial studies, as you can see here, have suggested uh, a response rate uh, that's not very impressive in colon cancer, uh, uh, whereby in lung cancer, for example, almost everyone responded nicely to this. Now, why is that? The same, the same, and when we go back to the story with BRAF mutations, the same story sticks here, is that you get that activation uh, of, uh, of, EGF, of EGFR, and so you have to combine an EGFR inhibitor with the G12C inhibitor. And that's where the, 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 that's where the study has, has looked at this uh, combination with, with an agent uh, called AMG510. So that's another G12C and essentially showed that the two are synergistic. Uh, and uh, now all the development beyond, uh, you know, beyond the, the single agent is with, with dual, uh, dual targeting and that essentially is moving to second line in colorectal cancer. So when we think uh, about a colon cancer with our paradigm, so we have you know, a lot of options and uh, from the BRAF E600E mutations, MSI high, HER2 amplifications, TMB high, uh, and others that we continue to look at. And if you look at the survival of our patients with colon cancer in 20 years, it went from 12 month to 40 month, in fact, I can tell you that in a couple of years from now, we'll start talking about more than half of our patients living uh, five years and close to 30, 40% are going beyond 10 years with metastatic disease. And that's coming out from uh, closer to five to 10% reaching the five years mark uh, in, uh, in 2000. So remarkable progress, but we're not stopping there. We continue. And we continue the development because we continue to understand that this is not one disease. There's quite a bit of genetic diversity and molecular diversity in this disease. And you know there are challenges uh, to develop drugs in a, for a rare target, the 0.7, the 1%, um, because, because of, of, of the financials, of course, you know, I mean, to be able to attract industry partners to consider going after a, a rare target uh, you have to test a lot of patients to find one, and that, that includes challenges. Uh, and, and there is what we call the rare target testing fatigue that we all experience, meaning, you know, every, every time I have a discussion with my patient, uh, I, I discuss, you know, uh, the possibility of finding this target with a one in 100 and one in 500 chances. And you'll have this long enough, and after that, you know, either it falls uh, uh, off your radar. Um, or, or, or you become less interested in it. And so that's a serious consideration and has led actually to many good agents being dropped. But I think we have better ways now to do this. Um, and, and it's really how you design your studies. The master protocols that, that we develop and industry develops with us have the objective of actually taking these uh, agents that uh, target uh, rare subsets uh, into the clinic and ultimately, uh, you know, through FDA approval processes. There are three types of trials that we consider part of this master protocol. There's the umbrella, which is, you know, relatively attractive, is the one, you know, we're focusing on most of our effort because it's disease specific, but also goes through multiple target therapies. So you pull your resources into one large trial uh, and colon cancer. So makes it attractive and makes, makes you less likely to have that fatigue, uh, rare target fatigue. The basket trial, the basket trial has been a good point of entry for say MSI high disease and tract fusions, where you study a single target therapy in the context of multiple diseases. So you're not really focusing on one disease, you're just focusing on the target. And then the platform, the platform is overarching. Uh, which you know works well with the umbrella plant uh, with the umbrella uh, trial uh, because it allows us essentially to ask uh, translational studies, scientific studies, uh, as 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 we build the next lens. This this came from MD Anderson essentially and did show that uh, you know you 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 lose by by looking randomly in uh, thousands of patients for a, for a target even though in this case, you know, by uh, extensively genotyping every patient, only 4% ended up actually enrolling on tumor agnostic genotype match trials. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a significant 
a significant investment and, and many times uh, non-yielding, uh, unfortunately. But we, we, we learn, we learn and we, we, we continue to learn as we develop you know, strategies that, that help us move forward. Uh, so when we look at rare instances where histology tumor agnostic approvals such as n fusion and initially for MSI high and, and, and ultimately uh, studying G12C, we started with these, with these tumor agnostic uh, 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 studies that ultimately led uh, to more disease specific studies. We also learned that in, in those uh, basket trials such as NCI match, which you know, didn't yield much in terms of improving uh, outcomes, but at least told us that, uh, well, wait a minute, there are a lot of these actionable mutations. If, if, you, if you look at, at all the potential mutations, there'll be 20, 30% patients that will qualify for an agent. So that's not anymore. If we pull these resources together, we're not talking about the 0.5%. 0.5%, but we're talking about a third or, or a half of our patients being able to, to get on these, on these trials. Now, the problem with these basket trials is you lose the biologic effect because disease contacts remain relevant. I mean, we showed that with the BRAF mutations. We showed that with the KRAS G12C, maybe not as much with the, with the uh, MSI high, but, uh, but at least with, with others where, where it matters uh, in the setting. Uh, also, you lose sometimes the response rate when you have some tumors that respond extremely well and others that don't. Uh, so you can have a dilution effect, which can affect certainly, uh, you know, the likelihood of finding that response. And, you know, there, 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 there is an unclear roadmap for regulatory approval. How can we convince our, uh, uh, you know, industry partners that to invest in these trials if they don't have a roadmap? to get the drugs approved that's looking for a needle in a haystack. And we do lose a lot on the science and understanding, you know, the importance of, of, of biomarkers and, and how to collect, uh, you know, uh, uh, samples and what to do with them. So, you know, as I said, I like, I like the idea of these umbrella trials because they're very focused on one disease. You know, you get investigators working with industry partners uh, on rational uh, uh, questions that essentially lead individually to baskets uh, in a specific disease that may ultimately lead to an approval. There's also, you know, the capacity to include that that uh, uh, platform, umbrella platform, uh, and leads to translational framework that will continue enhancing our knowledge and understanding of, of you know, what next. One of the major issues with, uh, with the tissue, meaning multiple biopsies is cost and risk and, and, and time it takes. Uh, so many times think about our patients, you know, we see them in clinic, uh, they're referred from another institution. We don't have the tissue available. We have to get the tissue. We have to send it to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to either internal lab or external lab. It takes about four weeks, six weeks to get the answer. If we want to do the biopsy, the biopsy is costly, but also the biopsy can be complicated. And, and especially if it's outside the liver, we can get significant complications, uh, say, for example, for intrathoracic biopsies. And the delay can be frustrating. The delay can lead to delays in treatment and certainly, you know, we'll lose some, uh, some value there. So part of where we're moving with a lot of our, not just our studies, but also our clinical practice, is circulating tumor DNA. So we know that these cancers, when they break down, the cancer cells break down, they shed these, uh, the DNA into the circulation. So I don't have to essentially go and look, uh, look for a biopsy. I can essentially have a great snapshot in time of, these, uh, of the DNA. And, and, and the methods have become so sensitive that you can essentially detect at a high level of sensitivity and specificity, the circulating DNA from the tumor uh, in the bloodstream. The cool thing about it too is, unlike biopsies, you know, biopsy is one 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 snapshot uh, snapshot in time. So tumors are both uh, uh, heterogeneous, uh, intratumorally and intertumorally. Meaning, if you biopsy lesion A and lesion B, they may have different uh, uh, expressions. And so you can't capture that. And we're not going to go with a needle and, and, and biopsy 10, 20, 30 lesions. 
uh, we learned from our hematology uh, colleagues, such as uh, Dr. Flynn, you know, that you actually, your best bet is to find, uh, you know, the, 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 the source from the blood. And, and the nice thing about this is, is you know, the circulating uh, tumor DNA is, is a dynamic function and uh, gives you a snapshot, not just of one tumor, but the overall tumor burden, because every, everywhere you're shedding. So you understand a little bit more the composition uh, uh, the, uh, the genomic composition of the tumor. And, and the, the other great thing about all of this is, and these studies have been done, is that when you compare circulating 3D DNA to tissue, the mutation frequency are similar. So you're not missing uh, by doing the blood. You also look, as I said, in clonal dynamics, meaning over time how things will change. And this, this essentially study did show that in colorectal cancer, when you do serial monitoring with blood, which is something you can't do with tissue, you actually do see these emerging clones and some disappearing clones that help you decide on the type of treatment at that, at that point of time. Of course, this is mostly now in the research world, but moving slowly into the clinic. And you know, part of the applicability of this is you think about your patient, you, know, you get their circulating tumor DNA under pressure with treatment, uh, a, a subclonal mutation driving treatment resistance become dominant, then, you know, you find this out, you target it, you, you, you challenge it, you bring it down, and then you challenge, you re-challenge with your initial target therapy. <laughs> so that's one way to think about it. We actually have built this platform through our research network, <clears throat> uh, addressing essentially the uh, limitations of, uh, uh, of, of, of having individual baskets. And this is an umbrella protocol, massive protocol. We're gonna screen 5,000 patients. We've already screened about a couple of hundred and, 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 and you know, this is accelerating. Uh, <clears throat> we hope over the next three to four years, you know, to be able to screen at least 5,000 patients, uh, all with circulating tumor DNA and, and, and findings from the circulating tumor <coughs> DNA will determine what, what basket the patient can go on. Some of these baskets are essentially uh, uh, dynamic in, in terms that we do multiple testing uh, and, and patients can go, go from one basket to the other uh, for some targets. And we have multiple targets that are already ongoing, others being planned for. Uh, so we, 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 in that sense, <clears throat> if you think about it, when, when I'm in the clinic speaking to my patient about the platform, I have almost a 30 to 50% chance that I'm gonna find a target within six to seven days because it's, it screens with circulating tumor DNA that will place my patient into one of these, uh, these baskets. And we're not stopping there. We have all these um, different concepts in development. This is a multi-institutional effort. You know, our research consortium includes uh, uh, multiple institutions that are part of this platform uh, that, that is led by Mayo Clinic uh, but but uh, but a lot of these ideas are coming from non-Mayo investigators, from our you know colleagues in in MD Anderson, Maurice Sloan, and in, in uh, USC, Duke. A lot of work from Duke, and and these are the sites and keep on growing. Uh, you know, we try to regionally to be cognizant of the fact that we need to have these close uh, to most of the population of the United States. We also are working very closely with our Japanese colleagues. Uh, at least on bringing the science together and building those cohorts together. Um, our Japanese colleagues, of course, uh, you know, have chosen a name that's uh, very creative, Godzilla, uh, for their, uh, for their uh, uh, basket trial. Uh, but I can tell you, I mean, working with our Japanese colleagues is just, uh, just a marvel. I mean, the efficiency of them conducting trials and uh, the cleanliness of the data and, and their capacity to answer translational questions in real time is unparalleled. So it's been a pleasure to work with them. And <clears throat> between the two platforms, uh, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna have at least 25% to 30% of the patients with actionable profile that we're gonna find pathways uh, for agents to be, to be developed in. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we are partnering with industry. Many ideas are, are investigator ideas, meaning our Investigators are coming up with them. Industry is giving grants, but there are also some uh, studies that are actually industry studies that are being integrated into the platform. Uh, 
So this way, you know, you think about it, Pfizer does not want to work with BMS uh, because of, of all the IP issues, et cetera. Here we're providing everyone a platform that they can collaborate on without really working with each other. They work through us. And, 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 and we actually do a lot of the work. I want to finish this with, you know, essentially showing you the value of these liquid biopsies and why and we're really moving more and more in the drug development world to use those. So the, our Japanese colleagues did two studies, uh, Scrum and then Godzilla. Godzilla was the, the liquid biopsy driven platform. Scrum was all tissue biopsy. And what they've seen when they compared the two studies is that when we use tissue and their system is actually more efficient than ours because everything is relatively centralized. There was, there was on average, uh, about uh, a month plus before you can actually get, get the results. With, uh, with the plasma, and they, believe it or not, they actually ship it to the States and it comes back to them where the results takes about 12 days. In our Colomate platform, it's about seven days. But the interesting thing is they haven't seen a lot of difference in the actual alterations when they did tissue with GI screen versus Godzilla, meaning they haven't lost. Uh, uh, much of what the sensitivity remains high and the specificity as well. But their enrollment rate has been on fire, meaning they were able to get the answers to the questions quicker by allowing a liquid platform rather than tissue platform. That's a gain for our patients. I mean, uh, we, we owe it to our patients to ask the question efficiently, quickly, and give them the results quickly so we can move on either move forward or move on to the next question. And I think this plasma platform does that for sure. And that's great. And, and, and it hasn't stopped essentially the level of enrollment. So in conclusion for this, at least, you know, that these umbrella trials such as uh, Colomate and Godzilla, you know, are valuable tools in the development of target strategies in colon cancer. In fact, you know, I can tell you that we're moving beyond just colon. We're going to pancreas, we're going to biliary, we're going to gastric. So we have similar platforms that are being developed in other cancers as well. And, and this is quite unique. I mean, this, a, 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 this in the United States, at least, and frankly, even outside Japan and the US, these, these are unparalleled uh, 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 platforms. So we're very proud of them. Uh, they're optimized for feasibility, efficiency, and ultimately, you know, because, because it, it matters to, to us and to our industry partners, fi financial viability by pulling all these resources together. So we're offering an economic solution to ask very hard questions. And uh, we also, you know, with, with focusing on one disease, we're really focusing on uh, the importance of the biology of that disease and the target. So rather than separate the target from the disease, we're actually combining the target and the disease. And we know that that matters, especially as, as we continue to develop and showing you multiple examples of why, why this happens. It, it also serves as flexible platforms to help explore in real-time strategies based on disease and target relevant science. And we, you know, we will understand mechanisms of resistance. And so we'll keep on going after those emerging clones uh, with agents as they uh, as they emerge, and hopefully again, you know, uh, be able to create a model where we can target cancer and the emerging uh, resistance uh, uh, mechanisms in real time. Thank you. I'll take uh, questions at this point of time. All right, that was you know, Tony. That was phenomenal. That's it's. I think everyone sh that's listening. Uh, would, would agree that was a tremendous talk and certainly gives us a lot of hope and a lot of things to think about is how things have changed certainly over time. Um, there's, a, there's a number of questions and uh, maybe a couple, these may not be that easy, but just you talked about the difference and I, I think you actually gave the one of the best analogies of umbrella versus basket trials. And I'm just wondering where you position them. If you were to, to look at your drug development uh, model, do you position basket trials up front where you can kind of test as a group around multiple different tumors and then start isolating specific molecules per um, disease and then bring them into umbrella as a kind of a library of treatments or how, how do you go about doing that? Yeah, so it's been it's been interesting. I think I think uh, the uh, the uh, basket trials are uh, becoming more and more even selective in that sense, meaning that even when designing basket trials, uh, most of these basket trials are not just taking all comers. 
but say specifically focusing like uh, with these agents KRAS G12C on lung and colon or lung colon and other GI or breaking down uh, uh, the baskets under a larger umbrella, focusing on each individual disease rather than have an umbrella for all diseases. Um, so the, the first phase can, can remain in many instances, especially when the target is incredibly rare as a first point of development uh, in basket trials. Uh, but ultimately, uh, you have to move into these umbrella platforms as your targets become multiple. So in colon cancer, it makes sense. In cholangio, it made sense. In pancreas, we're still struggling a little bit with ident identifying those targets of interest. And so an umbrella trial may be difficult to do in pancreas. And you may want to uh, remain in the, in the uh, basket world for, for a while. For lung cancer, you know, there are, and, and breast, multiple examples of umble, umbrella studies that have moved uh, the field forward. So oh, great. Um, you talked about the dilution effect potential from some of these studies and what's your sense as far as um, where we're gonna be going more globally from a sense, standpoint of serial targeted therapies versus concurrent um, molecular targeted in, in concert? You know, so I, I think as we understand more and more, so I'll, I'll go back to colon cancer, for example, you know, one example is the MET ampli amplification as a, mechanism of, uh, as a mechanism of resistance to EGFR inhibitors and HER2 uh, uh, inhibitors. And it's been interesting because when you look at, for example, tumors uh, that are untreated with EGFR inhibitors or with HER2 inhibitors, the likelihood of finding a MET amplification is incredibly small, if, if any. So it's, it, it, it emerges as a, as, as a mechanism of resistance, and so more sequential than concomitant. And on the other hand, and again, so depending on the target, on the other hand, you know, for uh, agents that target the MAPK uh, pathway, um, you know, the best, the best option, initial option, at least to get your maximal response is to combine uh, targets rather than to use them sequentially. So all depends again on the, on the target. Uh, and I, I suspect it's probably a mixture of both. Great. So veering a little bit from targeted therapies real, around, obviously it's been a pretty a tumultuous time over the last year and a half. And um, as we're looking at colorectal screening and um, colonoscopies as a gold standard, what, what's your sense of, of <clears throat> Continuing that versus um, some of the stool-based tests mm. and, um, and the prevention of colorectal cancers. And then the second part of that is, what about using social determinants of health as far as barriers that could drive that? And has anyone looked at that? Yes. Well, that's a, thank you. That's a fantastic question. And, you know, Mayo Clinic has actually been a pioneer in that, uh, including looking at, at under, underserved populations and uh, that are less likely to be screened because of access, but also less, less because of, of lack of education about, about prevention. Um, so the stool-based tests you know, are, are important. I mean, I, I, don't think, I don't think they will replace colonoscopies, but they, they, they perform pretty well. And the one test that comes to mind, so he, here, he, here's what's happening. So one test that comes to mind is the stool-based test, ColoGuard which has actually had significant uptake. Um, and my understanding is up to a million uh, folks that have been screened through it uh, and more coming. And we've looked essentially into Native American tribes as well as Alaskan Native tribes uh, that don't have access necessarily because of distance, again, as I said, uh, or lack of education or the lack of interest. Culturally, uh, colonoscopy is not necessarily accepted uh, uh, worldwide. So. So this, this certainly has, has helped screen a number of colon cancers, but I tell you where this is going next. As you go back to the circulating uh, uh, DNA platforms, so the, 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 the stool DNA uh, platforms, methylated DNA, which is forms ColoGuard, now uh, ha are being looked at uh, uh, as part of uh, uh, blood screening tests. And that's not just true for colon, but all types of cancers. So essentially, you take the same markers that you find in the stools uh, and you check for them in blood. Uh, the sensitivity may be a little bit lesser, but uh, imagine, you know, in a few years from now with a blood test, you can actually achieve the same thing you do with a stool test 
or with a with a colonoscopy. But here's here's what's even cool, even more cool about this, is it's not stopping just at colon cancer, uh, but it's liver cancer, it's uh, gastroesophageal cancer, it's uh, breast cancer. So you may, uh, we may ultimately in a few years from now be able through one blood test, be able to screen for multiple cancers. Um, so yeah, this is an emerging field. And I think in terms of the socioeconomical determinants and the limitations of, of current screening methods, um, this, this could be an equalizer in the future. What's your sense on what's been going on since the onset of COVID and as far as colorectal cancer screening, you've seen different things as far as screenable cancers having a delay because people aren't getting to the um, to, to receive screening care. So we're seeing some advanced diagnoses. Have you seen anything that really speaks to, to that? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And there are publications about that. It's been a terrible time. Uh, I think the side effect of a lot of these uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a lot of the, the, the measures that have been associated with, with, uh, with preventing COVID spread have also had that side effect of preventing folks to come to the hospital. But that also had to do with also uh, all of us being overwhelmed also with, with the COVID, <clears throat> with COVID hospitalizations and stretching us very thin uh, and the fear factor, you know, for patients to be in facilities, which, you know, we all know that we have, we have taken all measures to ensure that our patients are safe. In fact, I always tell my patients the safest place to be is actually in our most sterile environments and hospitals and clinics. But unfortunately, that has delayed significantly, uh, you know, early screening efforts, uh, including in younger patients. I mean, in colon cancer, for example, where we see now a rise of patients in, uh, uh, with colon cancer in their 40s, uh, where screening age now has been, uh, uh, has been lowered to 45 and likely to 40 soon uh, because we're seeing essentially uh, an, an, an epidemic. Uh, uh, I think, I think, and I see that in my clinic, uh, you know, we've seen some significant uh, uh, increase in patients presenting with later stages because essentially of the lack of screening, true for HCC, true for a lot of other cancers, breast cancer and others. And, and also, you know, for non-cancer diseases, but not, not the subject matter here. So certainly a tragedy, and it'll take us years to, years to recover, unfortunately, years. One, one last question. Um, with your affinity for plasma-based uh, circulating free DNA tests, and when you're trying to, to decide which stage two colorectal cancers to treat with systemic therapy, mm -hmm. what's your opinion on tumor-informed or tissue-based uh, tests versus plasma-based tests? And then after that, what, what about surveillance after treatment? Yeah, so that's that's an emerging field, and that now relates to early stage cancer and assessment of minimal residual disease. And there are two types of platforms, so we call the tumor informed and and the tumor uninformed. And they're different. The tumor informed one meaning that you match the tumor to the blood, which theoretically may may have a higher level of sensitivity. Although we still need to compare the two modalities to understand that a little bit better. Uh, the tumor uninformed essentially is uh, using DNA and uh, methylated DNA without actually tumor. So it's more tumor agnostic in that sense. Uh, I'm sorry, it's tumor, uh, tum more tumor specific. The tumor informed is more tumor agnostic, meaning it doesn't matter because you have the tumor on hand. Uh, so th th there's an advantage for each, right? I mean, but for stage two and stage three colon cancer, uh, resected, usually you have tumor on hand, very accessible. Uh, so I personally favor the tumor informed uh, because I, I do think that it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it gives you a slight advantage. Now, you know, how do you use it in clinic? And that's, that's a challenge uh, because most of the studies suggest a prognostic, uh, um, you know, a prognostic uh, 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 significance for, for these, uh, for the, for, for, for these tests, meaning let's say, let's say a patient with stage two colon cancer to answer the question, uh, you know, presents and has, uh, uh, through the, one of the tests that are commercially used has a, a positive minimal residual disease. So MRD positive, that is an indication that the cancer is likely to come back at close to hundred percent rate. So you know that the recurrence rate is high. The next question is, well, so is this the patient that 
you know, if we expose to adjuvant chemotherapy, whereby without the test, the patient would not receive adjuvant chemotherapy. Is that the particular patient that would benefit from adjuvant therapy? The answer is we don't know. Uh, there are studies right now that are studying the predictive value. So right now we understand it's prognostic. We don't understand the predictive value. Uh, and so it can get quite, uh, quite confusing uh, in actual clinical practice. The other problem with this is of course, if you do it after, let's say you give adjuvant chemotherapy and the patient remains positive, um, you know, how do you, uh, how do you follow up? Do you change your every three to six month routine? Do you add scans? So there's a lot for us to learn right now. Uh, I think I put it in the prognostic category until shown otherwise. Great. Well, that was really incredible. I think you all see why um, Dr. Saab is considered a world's expert. He's ex not only is he um, exceedingly brilliant in this area, but he's the care he gives to patients is kind, caring, and compassionate. And really, um, it's it's a model for us all. I think so. Thank you, Tony, for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, I, I want to thank the Garlos, Lee, Matt, Amy, Dana, and the whole family. Thank you for all you do. It's uh, really appreciated. Hopefully you feel like I do that we're bringing some really great education to, um, to the, the community. So thank you for, for all you do. Um, much appreciated. Some housekeeping just for participants in this webinar will receive an email with the evaluation link to complete for continuing education credits. Um, after tonight, this lecture will be available at uh, the NortonCME.com and uh, select the on-demand on option. Uh, appreciate you all joining us and thanks again to the Garla family and the Norton Health Care Foundation. As always, they're just incredibly supportive of our cancer mission. Um, thank you for making this possible. Um, as Russ would say, stay safe and keep the faith. And thank you everyone for joining us.